Okay, now that the last straggler is in, we can, <laughs> we can begin here. My name is Chris Wolf. I'm co-director of the Thomas International Center. It's an educational institute that tries to get students and others to think about life's big questions, where we come from, where we're going, how to live our lives, drawing especially on the classical and Christian intellectual tradition from Aristotle and Plato to uh, John Paul II, C.S. Lewis, uh, giving a special interest to the natural law tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas and the basic principles of the American founding as well. So we do lots of different activities uh, on all different kinds of subjects. We're definitely interdisciplinary. We don't try to confine ourselves just to philosophy or theology or politics or sociology or whatever. Uh, we try to uh, address a lot of the big questions in life. And certainly one of them has to do with how we deal with the other sex. And so tonight my topic is dating, self-respect, and faith. Why we have to aim high to be happy. And uh, the first half of the talk is going to be basically setting up the question by looking at one particular kind of academic analysis, namely what's sometimes called the economics of sex. And having set up the problem that way, I'm going to try to move on to, to, to analyze the situation, especially the situation that young women find themselves in today. And in some ways, I'm primarily addressing myself to women, though much of what I say will be applicable to men as well. And even if it's not, it's good for the men to overhear what I say to the women, because that might be valuable for them. Uh, these are very complicated questions, and there isn't just one way to do many things. People are very different, and different people have different answers. Uh, I'm not a woman, and so that may both add to and limit the value of what I have to say tonight. May add to it because I give a somewhat different perspective, a male perspective that some of you might find interesting. Uh, it also limits the value of what I say as well, uh, since I certainly can't claim to capture fully uh, a woman's experience of dating, marriage, sex, and so forth. <clears throat> Moreover, though I am not a woman, I am married to you. And I uh, well, Aristotle says about friendship that when you're somebody's friend, the things that happen to that person are as if they happen to you. And so I hope that after living with that woman for 40 years, I have learned uh, a bit from her. Uh, in fact, much of what I say tonight will draw on what I consider her great wisdom. Uh, and I, I look forward to discussion at the end of the talk as well. We'll be taping the, the talk itself, but we'll turn the tape off at the end so that we can have a free and candid discussion. And I'll be very interested to hear your perspectives on a lot of these questions, uh, especially since, as my wife reminds me often, you know, we were in your position a long time ago in a very different society. I mean, it was a very different world that we lived in 40, 45 years ago. So, uh, so let me you know, start that way with that background. And let me turn now to what's called the economic analysis of sex. A preliminary warning for many of you, especially if you have a rather romantic view, which is I think the right view, uh, this may be a very depressing account. Economists are not known for being happy-go-lucky to begin with, so I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, nonetheless, it, it can be particularly depressing to talk about love and sex and marriage, primarily in terms of supply and demand and, and, and things of that sort. So what is economics about? Well, typically, it focuses on the production, distribution, and exchange of goods and services, uh, especially in markets. And generally, exchanges in free markets are controlled by the laws of supply and demand. When supply is low and demand is high, prices tend to go higher. When supply is high and demand is low, prices are lower. Over time, prices, they say, move to a point of equilibrium. You know, that is, 
you know, when the, the price goes up, more people will get into providing that good, and the result will be that eventually the price will fall. And if fewer people want a good, eventually some people have to stop, you know, trying to produce it, and the price will go back up a bit. Uh, in fact, that's the point of the market mechanism. The price mechanism is a way of telling a whole lot of other people without actually talking to them what we as a society want more of and what we want less of. No one thinks that economic exchange should be completely unregulated. For example, no matter how high the demand is for hitmen or assassins, you know, we probably are not going to uh, actually have a, a legal market in those. Now, there will always be a black market in them. There is, in fact, a black market, you know, uh, but uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a legitimate market. Uh, what the scope of regulation should be is pretty controversial. For example, one big question today, a controversial one is, should there be a market in body parts? You know, what if you want to sell your kidney to somebody, or sell a lung to somebody, or sell part of your body because somebody else wants it? You can make a fair amount of money to do that. I mean, obviously, you also have, uh, these days, uh, the selling of eggs, uh, the selling of sperm, uh, you know, <coughs> sexual parts as well. Should people be able to sell these things? Um, as I say, it's very controversial. Uh, women sometimes, these days, in effect, rent their wombs out to other people, you know, through surrogacy. surrogacy. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether this is a desirable thing is, is, as I say, very controversial. Now, economic analysis can be applied to almost any kind of human interaction. And recently, scholars have applied it to sex, and in particular to the phenomenon of sexual relationships involved in dating, courtship, and marriage. Now, different people, men and women, want love and sex and marriage. Uh, that is, there's a demand for them. Different people are willing and able to provide love, sex, or marriage. That is, there's a supply of them. In the marketplace where people interact sexually, you might say there are prices for love and sex and marriage that are determined by supply and demand. People, men and women, have to determine what they can and what to sell in the marketplace and what they can and want to buy in the marketplace. So what do these economic analysts say about dating, courtship, love, and marriage? Well, the first thing they say is, men want sex more than women do, and so sex is primarily a woman's resource in the marketplace. As mostly, women have something that men want and will, in effect, compete or bid for in the marketplace. Uh, second, men therefore have to pay for sex somehow. I'm not talking necessarily about prostitution, although that's of course one way that some men pay for sex. The traditional way that men have paid for sex is marriage. That is, they provide financial security and a certain kind of status and protection to women in exchange for the possibility of men having sex with them, having a sexual relationship. Uh, now, that's changed a fair amount uh, because of changes in what you might call the marketplace for sex, love, and marriage, especially in the last 50 years. Various social changes since the 1960s have had a huge impact. One is the improving economic status of women. Women in the past generally have been very dependent on men economically. That is no longer half as true and uh, anywhere near as true as it once was. Women are now not excluded from the, uh, from the marketplace, from economic activities, from jobs, uh, and therefore they're able to support themselves a great deal and don't need men as much for that reason. There's also a big change with respect to education, partly related to to the entry of women into the marketplace, women have also entered into educational institutions as well. As a matter of fact, you know, as you probably all know, in higher education today, there is a decided imbalance between men and women. 
there are actually many more women in higher education. They're much more likely to get degrees than men are. And that has some really interesting effects because especially among higher socioeconomic achievers, there's a lot more women than there are men. And when you have a, that supply and demand configuration, what results from that is that uh, men are much more able to get sex cheaply. You know, they don't have to commit as much to get sex because there's a smaller number of men relative to a larger number of women. And so in a way, the price of the men goes up and the price of the woman goes down. And another of the effects is that marriage tends to be put off. You know, because with the uh, entry of women into both education and business, uh, or j different kinds of jobs, the result is that you extend the period of education, you get involved in a job first and get settled with that, and then you think of getting married. So I was not typical uh, when my wife and I got married when I was, uh, I think I was 23 and she uh, was almost 23. Nowadays, however, the average age for men is almost 30 and for women is about 28. So that's a, a significant extension of the time between puberty and the time of marriage. And one of the effects of that has been also to encourage a lot more sexual activity uh, before marriage, premarital sexual activity. Finally, in some ways, maybe the most important law in this whole matter is effective contraception. The game entirely. Before that time, the potential price for sex for a woman was extremely high. It was a child. And the transformation of life that occurs when you bear a child and have to take care of it. And men uh, were also constrained because there was a social norm that, in effect, said if you do engage in premarital sexual relations and the woman does conceive, then there was a, a tremendous pressure on the men to do the right thing and to marry the woman. That has profoundly changed. Uh, I won't say that sex is cost-free, because in fact that's the last thing in the world that's true. Uh, it's not true at all. But it, it does mean that certain kinds of immediate and obvious costs of sex no longer exist, so that it's easier for men and women to engage in uncommitted sex. And in fact, the, the levels at which they do that has increased uh, dramatically. Now, what are some of the, the results of this change? Uh, women can en engage in sex at a much lower cost than themselves, and that was a key to the sexual revolution. As women engaged in sex more readily, that is, as the supply of sex rose, the price of sex for men fell. They didn't have to commit either through marriage or even sometimes emotionally. Thus, there was a great increase in casual sex to which men are more inclined than women, by and large. Women committed to premarital virginity had an increasingly su small supply of men to choose from. And the demand for these women was much lower. And so they were at an especially uh, difficult uh, position in this new society. In addition, women who engaged in uncommitted non-marital sex during their 20s found that after they established themselves professionally and were ready to marry and have children, they were less desirable commodities in the sexual and marriage marketplace in their 30s. And so you actually have this whole raft of articles written by women in places like you know, the Atlantic you know, Monthly, uh, where women are basically free, independent, on their own, and not very happy at their position. As there's a lot of complaining among uh, women about this uh, 
uh, this new marketplace. In many ways, they value it and affirm it, and in other ways, they complain about some of the effects in it. Another effect is that higher achieving women found that the supply of men who were their equals in education and income was much smaller. And so many of them were faced with the choice of either not marrying or marrying down as to somebody of lower status, lower income, lower education than themselves. Now, much more could be said about the economic analysis of sex, but this gives you a flavor for the economic analysis. Now, not all of this will come as a surprise to you. I mean, you've probably heard things like this before. Uh, one could say that it's a particularly effective way of describing a less elevated way of thinking about love, marriage, and sex. And that can't be ruled out because, unfortunately, given original sin, you know, that's the way, you know, oftentimes, uh, many men and women act. That's the way they think. So, having said that, though, I want to emphasize very strongly what I consider to be the, the narrowness of this view, uh, whether or not it provides some particular insights. If somebody were to adopt this, at, at this, to adopt this as their basic framework for looking at love, sex, and marriage, uh, I think they'd be in, in real trouble. The first point that can be made is just from the standpoint of economics itself. There's an economist named John Mueller who at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington who's written a really interesting book called Redeeming Economics. And he argues that there's a lot of value in modern economics, but there's a whole area that modern economics ignores and really can't account for very well. And that is the area of the gift. So much of economic life, so much of the production and distribution and exchange of wealth doesn't occur in a marketplace where there's actually buying and selling. A lot of it is in the form of gift. And if you don't understand that, the economic statistics that you use are not going to give as accurate a view of what society is really like. Think of this, for example, gross domestic product, which is a key economic statistic, does not include virtually any of the work that women do in the home, taking care of the home and raising children. This is a huge part of what goes on in society. I mean, it's, it's a huge part of human life, and it just doesn't appear on the economic radar because it's not remunerated. And if it's not remunerated, in a way, it, it doesn't count to economists. And yet, if you want to analyze society, if you exclude that, you're, you're excluding a huge part of what goes on in society and social life. More importantly, though, even getting away from the economics, uh, the economic analysis of sex just misses a whole lot of what's really important about love, sex, and marriage. I mean, what it does is basically take a phenomenon and by looking at it from only one perspective, it truncates that phenomenon. It ignores and, and misses a very large part of what the phenomenon is. That is, when we think about the human experience of love, sex, and marriage, it, it doesn't, it's not easily reducible to just economic ex, uh, exchange or transactions. I, I gave a talk the other night at UNC on the idea of liberal education, especially citing a book called The Idea of a University by John Henry Cardinal Newman. And Newman makes the argument in that, in that book that if you focus simply on one science, there's a danger that the science becomes imperialistic, that it tries to start going beyond its own competence and claiming to do more than it can and shoving out other things. And that leads to a loss of other perspectives that really damages our ability to understand reality. And I think this is actually a great example of it. You know, if economists, in a way, claim to have the secret of everything, to tell the whole story, 
what happens is you end up you know, kind of cutting off the things that economics can't really account for. And the result is a, a, a very truncated view, a, a minimalist view that doesn't really understand the full range of the phenomenon. So having said that, you know, I, want to, I do want to say that at least the economic analysis of sex does kind of set up a certain kind of problem. And it's the problem that I want to address myself to tonight, primarily. And that is especially a problem I noted of a young woman who wants to achieve happiness by having a great love and a good marriage and wants to achieve that and especially to achieve it without uh, having to, in a way, barter for it through s sexual activity that some men demand. And in a way, what I'm asking is the question, how could a young woman who wants to remain chaste and who wants to be happy deal with this marketplace that looks so problematic for her given the changes that have occurred in society. And uh, that's what I'm going to spend the, the bulk of my talk tonight on. I want to ask, how can a woman pursue happiness in the current circumstances of our social world? In some ways, this is a modification of a rather frequently asked question, which is a constant puzzle to men. What do women want? <laughs> men are constantly asking themselves, what do women want? And Really, the question I'm asking is, what should women do? You know, which focuses not so much on what she wants to get as how she can actively pursue what she wants, which is happiness. Happiness is what we all want. It's what we all pursue. But we tend to seek it in somewhat different ways. And there are, I think, clear gender differences here. What is it that men want above all? I mean, certainly, they want to be loved, too. But in some ways, I think the natural male tendency or goal is to want to be admired. Whereas for women, I think there's a, an emphasis on the desire to love, but especially to be loved. I think psychologically, it is deeply rooted in a woman's being to want to love and to be loved. It's what they yearn for. Now, wanting to be loved is a good thing in itself, of course, but it can also make women extremely vulnerable, especially emotionally vulnerable. In their eagerness to be loved, they may think that men ha are just like them, that they have the same desire to love and be loved as women. And I think men at their best do. But men are rarely at their best. And a lot of men are often not at their best. And the result can be real vulnerability for, for women, that men can use women's desire to be loved to manipulate them. And this is nothing new. I mean, basically, world literature, I mean, it's just replete with all kinds of stories, not to mention the Lifetime Channel, or to usually things that happen there, which is, in real life, you know, not so often uh, the case, I'm afraid. Many a woman gives her greatest gift, herself, all of herself, including her sexual self, because that is what great love requires. It's, if she wants to have a great love, she has to give all of herself to men who are unworthy of their love and who do not reciprocate it. And that is a, a, a terribly unfortunate thing. Now, the vulnerability of a woman is greatly enhanced by insecurity, by doubts about her desirability. And who doesn't, from time to time, doubt you know, their desirability? just as in some ways men face a somewhat different question. They, they ask themselves, not are they desirable, but they ask themselves, 
am I up to it? You know, am I, am I capable of responding to something that calls me to something great or admirable, uh, something to do? Uh, that vulnerability that's connected with insecurity is one reason that explains a well-known fact, a scientific fact, which is that young women who have a strong and loving relationship with their fathers are much, much less likely to be promiscuous than women who don't have a good relationship with their fathers. And it has precisely to do with this sense of security, their sense of self-worth. A, a young woman has grown up being loved by a father, it strengthens her own sense of self-worth in, in uh, profound ways, and precisely because of that, makes her less likely to engage in promiscuous activity as a way of, of searching for or finding some form of love. So a woman who has a high regard for her own dignity and worth will be much less vulnerable Self-respect, therefore, I think, is fundamental. It's key to a woman's happiness, that is to protecting her from vulnerability. Vulnerability especially to men who are not worthy of her. Now, one concrete implication of this fact is that a woman has to understand that relying on a man's love for her happiness indeed thinking that happiness lies in any limited creature, is likely to, re to lead to frustration and unhappiness. As Aristotle noted, for happiness, a certain modicum of external goods is required. You know, a certain amount of property, you don't want to be you know, so poor you're starving to death. Uh, a certain amount of uh, success in life, you know, pursuing some kind of project successfully, uh, a certain amount of, of prestige or regard from other people. You know, wealth, power, prestige, these things all involve external goods because they're not actually part of you as a person. They're external to you. And Aristotle, being a very commonsensical guy, says that this, these things are not unimportant. On the other hand, he also points out that if you rely simply on external goods for happiness, that's a problem. You know? One thing about it is simply that external goods are always chancy. You know, you can be rich and then lose all your money. You know, you can be powerful and then lose all your power. You know, it's not part of you. You know, it's it's something that's vulnerable to f to fate, you know, to chance, to how things in life change. In a certain way, if a woman looks at man as, as a man as something that's going to fulfill her, she can end up looking upon him in a way as, as a kind of external good. And it shares that kind of chanciness, you know, because if she's relying on that for her happiness, she may not be able to get what she wants. You know, it, it may be that she doesn't get a man who really makes her happy, or she may not get a man at all. And that's the problem. Ultimately, from a Christian perspective, there is no human reality that satisfies the human heart. Everything we have is limited in some way. I mean, you, I mean those people who think that if they only had X, they'd be happy, if you just give them as much of X as they want, it's not going to guarantee their happiness. We see that. People get unlimited amounts of sex or wealth or success, and yet we see many of those people being very unhappy. And so the Christian is not surprised by this, because the Christian, as St. Augustine argued, as he said famously, the Christian knows that our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, speaking to God. I mean, God is the only object that can completely satisfy the human heart. Every other creature has its limits, 
And if you put your happiness in a position where it relies on those creatures, it's always going to be very vulnerable. So with this as a background, based on what I've said, I want to give you six, I don't know what to call them, rules, mantras, slogans, watchwords, I don't know, six ideas to think about uh, that I think won't guarantee happiness, but will dramatically improve the likelihood that you'll be happy. Okay? So, what are these? Rule number one, or the mantra number one, I can be happy without a man, without marriage, without sexual love. Your happiness is not determined by a man or marriage or sexual love. This is not to say that human love is not the ordinary way that people attain a great deal of happiness in love. And in fact, for many people, you know, marriage, a good marriage, is a tremendous contribution to their happiness. That more than most of the things that many other people think about, you know, sex and wealth and pleasure and success and so forth. Uh, Still, even if marriage is a very wonderful thing, a woman, or a man for that matter, can never get themselves, or should never get themselves, in a position where they say, my happiness depends on that man, or this marriage, or whatever. And the reason is, because it's going to make her vulnerable, needy, and prone to making bad choices. And one way to phrase it, an interesting way I think, is that a woman who cannot be happy as a single woman is not likely to be happy as a married woman. Because the happiness ultimately has to come from inside ourselves. And it can't simply depend on somebody else. Now, many people react to this. I mean, some people just think it's crazy to think. You know, they, 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 don't, they don't necessarily say this out loud because they wouldn't go around saying, I can't be happy without a man. You know, but in fact, many people, I think, think that way, uh, even if they don't admit it. And their, their argument is, won't I be really lonely in life if I don't have a man or they, men usually realize it later in life, you know, that, that, that loneliness can be a factor in their life too. But they too often tend to come to understand that. Uh, it may be true that you will be lonely without marriage, but it may be that that is part of the human condition. It may be, in fact, that no one entirely avoids loneliness. One thing that a lot of people who are not married don't realize, especially when they look at good marriages, is the amount of loneliness in marriage. Even in a really good marriage, there's loneliness, and especially for women. And the reason is because women generally have emotional needs that men are totally incompetent to meet. I mean, women, really do have great emotions, deep emotions, and they need to connect to, to the person they love. Men do that to some extent, only to a very limited yeah. extent. So if a woman really puts all her apples in that basket, she's, she's gonna have problems, you know, because in effect, she's trying to make a man do what only God can do. You know, but, but a man can't perfectly fulfill her desire for that kind of emotional connection. Now, this doesn't mean that women should go to the opposite extreme 
and give up on love and men. Uh, I can understand how for you women that may be a temptation at times. And in fact, I know young women who have had that temptation. And face it, I don't have to look very far in fact. I have five sons and five daughters. And some of those daughters have been sorely tempted to give up on the other half of the human race. And I understand that uh, it's very understandable, but it's also premature. You know, it's giving up too easily, and that's probably a mistake. Uh, the paradox, interestingly, is that a woman who can say, yes, I can be happy without a man, without sexual love, without marriage, is much more likely to be self-confident about her love, her life, her happiness. She won't be as needy. And as a result, she will be more attractive. Interestingly, she'll be more sexually attractive. You know? Men fear needy women. You know? Just like in, I mean, women rightly fear needy men, right? I mean, you don't want to view dating as your kind of social charity project, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that, that would be a problem, you know, if you got yourself, or you're always the one trying to help the, the weirdo nerd, you know, I mean, that can, that, that's not likely, I mean, not, it doesn't mean you can't be kind to them, but I mean, if that's what, the way you conceive of dating, you know, you're likely not to have a very satisfying life. Uh, it's funny, self-confidence is so key that I would argue it makes a woman more physically attractive. Now, that sounds bizarre in a way, right? Because you think, well, the physical is just the physical, right? You know? But what I'm struck by over and over is how some women are more attractive than they should be physically just because they carry themselves with a certain confidence. I hate to say it, but you sometimes see this with rich women. There's women who are raised in higher socioeconomic circumstances have the money to try to, first of all, to kind of improve their looks and make the best out of it, and just also have a certain kind of confidence that sometimes comes from living with a higher socioeconomic status. And they actually end up looking more attractive and in some ways, their natural abilities would, would lead you to think they would be. It's a, it's a bizarre thing. But all I can say is, I think it's true. You know, I think if you actually kind of look at the world, uh, you find that, 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 a, that a woman who's self-confident is more attractive in general. And sexually, and when I say sexually, I don't mean just physically. Because remember, sexual attraction is only only a very limited part of it, an important but limited part is physical. A lot of sexual attraction has to do with things well beyond the physical. It has to do with the, the, the way a, a person carries himself or herself. And uh, I mean, another example is, is that you know, I say that men aren't attracted to needy women. They're actually attracted to women who have a certain kind of self-confidence, and even to the point of being able to put a man in his place. I mean, that, you know, a woman who can cut a man down a little bit when he gets too full of himself actually ends up being more attractive to the man <laughs> because he actually understands that she's right. And, he respects her for being a stronger person herself. So there, there's lots of stuff that's sexually attractive that's not necessarily physically attractive. But uh, self-confidence is really important. So there's a kind of paradox that the woman who feels capable of doing without a man sexual love is actually in a way more attractive 
and more in a position to attract that kind of love, which is interesting, I think. Rule number two, the mantra. I am worthy of a great love. In fact, I am already loved by the greatest lover, God, who is a real person and not just some abstraction. And if I give myself to a human love, I won't compromise my dignity by settling for a low kind of love. Women should feel absolutely committed to getting the love they deserve you know, and not settling for a lower kind of love. They don't want to compromise their dignity. A good and wise priest said to my wife on one occasion, what is our opinion about ourselves based on? You know, what determines our own attitude toward ourselves? He says there are three things. You can judge of yourself based on what other people think of you. You can judge yourself based on what you think of yourself. Or you can think about yourself the way God thinks about you. He says, two out of those three are fallible. You know, what other people want out of you is, is no guarantee you know, of what you should be. The fact that they, they would value you if you do X doesn't mean X is good for you. It may reflect just what they want. You know? Other people's opinions are notoriously unreliable. You know, no sure guide to happiness. Your own opinion is notoriously unreliable at times, right? Sometimes we do things, we think things about ourselves, and it turns out to be patently false. We learn by trial and error, you know, that we look at things not too well sometimes. God always knows us, he loves us, and his good opinion of us is the ultimate infallible foundation for our own self-respect and self-worth. God, again, not an abstraction, but a real person, thought enough of us to die for us, each of us. And that suggests that our self-worth is far beyond what we can even imagine ourselves. And in some ways, God loves us much more than we love ourselves because it's the nature of love to, to give itself. So that's what God ultimately does. So it's interesting, a woman who has faith, faith that God loves her, and has a high conception of her own dignity and worth, is able to have more self-confidence and a higher regard for herself in a way that I think even an unbeliever, even, even somebody who doesn't believe in God, could say that she really benefits from that. You know, so looking at it kind of objectively, even if you think that her belief in God is false, because you don't believe in God yourself, you could look at her and say, but boy, does she derive some tremendous benefits from having that belief. Because it does support her her self-respect, her sense of her tremendous dignity and worth, which makes her much less vulnerable to settling for people who are unworthy of her. That leads to the third mantra. I will give myself, all of myself, only to a good man and only in marriage. What this means is that when a woman evaluates a man, when she asks, do I want to give myself to this man completely? She has to ask about virtues. Now, that's probably not the way you think of dating, right? I'm going out this Friday to see what kind of virtues this guy has. Remember the the word for virtue in Greek, I mean, nowadays it has overtones of you know, being goody-goody or something like that, or following certain rules. The root of the word for virtue in Greek is it's the same word as the word for excellence. So 
So you're asking, do you want excellence or do you want what's the opposite of excellence? You know, I mean, do you want something low, you know, unattractive, base, whatever? Obviously, we want things that are more excellent. Moreover, think about the idea of living with somebody for 40 or 50 or 60 years. Do you want to live with a lazy person? It's no fun living with a lazy person because you get to do all the work. Okay? Do you want to live with somebody who's irresponsible, who says you'll do this, but then you can't count on him? Do you want to live with somebody who lacks integrity? You don't know if they actually live according to the values that they profess. Do you want to live with somebody who is not committed to fairness, to treating you fairly, treating everybody fairly, treating your children fairly? Do you want to live with somebody who lacks self-control? And I could go on and on and on. You know, when we think of who we want to live with, whether we call it this or not, we're thinking about virtues. We want to marry good people because goodness is good. It's desirable. It's, it's attractive. It's what makes life better when you live with someone. So when you're dating, when you're getting to know men, when you're trying to decide you know, who to pursue, who to continue to talk to, to, to ask yourself whether this is the person for you. That's what you should be asking. Is he responsible? Is he courageous? Is he generous? Is he fair? Is he hardworking? Is he patient? Is he persevering? Is he mild? Is he humble? And I say also, does he have faith? and hope and charity. Because if he has faith and hope and charity, his virtues have a very strong foundation. They don't just depend on his own choice at a given time in his life. They depend on a, a whole view of life that transcends the moment. Now, this doesn't mean that all you're looking for is virtues. Uh, virtues are great, but other things are important too. If you cannot have an interesting conversation with a person, you don't want to spend your life living with that person. <laughs> if the person has no sense of humor, you don't want to be living with that person. Uh, perhaps even if there's just no sexual spark at all, you don't want to be living with that person. Uh, there are other things that are important besides virtue. Uh, but, if you could only have one thing, if you could have a person who has virtues, but you don't have any real sexual spark with them, or if you could have another person for whom you have a pretty big sexual spark, but he's got no virtues, don't hesitate for a minute. This is a no-brainer, you know? Now, obviously, you want to get the person where you have the virtues, and the romance, the sexual spark, and so forth. But keep the order of priority straight. It will determine, likely enough, whether you will be happy in your marriage. Now, one of the big questions these days, asked in all these, these articles filled with angst, you know, by women in, in magazines, one of the big questions is, should we settle? You know, the women have gone to age 30. They've had an you know, active sexual life. They've established a good professional career. And they get to age 30. They know they're on the cusp of no longer being marketable. Because most men care about looks. And eventually, you know, in general, as you get into your 30s, you don't compete as effectively with women in their 20s. So these women realize there's they're on the cusp. They look around and they discover 
that there are a, not a lot of men who are at their own level of education and professional achievement and income. And so increasingly, they're asking themselves, should I settle? That is, should I settle for a guy that's really not the guy I want, the guy of my dreams, but it looks like he's the best that, can, that I can get at this point in life. And chances are that in the future, I won't be able to get anything better. So should a woman settle? There are two answers to that question. The first answer has to do with the inessentials. Should you settle with respect to a man's lack of some things that are not essential, not non-negotiable? And the answer is, you'd better because nobody's perfect. And if you have your laundry list, he's got to be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, you got 20 you know, qualities on the list. You're going to not, you know, pursue happiness with him because he's only got 19. You're nuts. You know, obviously, we all have to settle. I mean, there's, there's nobody that's, that's perfect. I mean, they're actually, situations where some people think the other person is perfect before marriage. But that's taken care of very quickly. <laughs> it doesn't take very long at all to find out that he's not perfect after all. You know, that he has real faults. And there are lots of things that are inessential. You know, all of us have habits or aspects that sometimes they even seem cute at first but eventually, it's just going to drive us bananas, you know? It may be five or ten years down the road, but it's just, you know, things are going to get under our skin. So, in, in some sense, you <coughs> obviously, we all settle, you know, un unless you're really deluded, kind of, unless you, your love really has made you blind, you do have some understanding that the person you're marrying has imperfections, has some, you know, personality quirks that, that you're not wild about. On the essentials, that's the other answer, never settle on the essentials. You know, never settle just because this is the best guy you can get, even though, excuse me, he's just not a, that great a guy. You know, uh, if you're gonna marry somebody who's really not somebody you admire, you're likely to be unhappy in your marriage. Men want to be admired, and women want to be loved by a man that they can admire. So if you don't admire somebody, don't marry them. And what admiration is usually about, again, you may not phrase it this way usually, but it really is about virtues. It's that the person has quality or characteristics of human excellence you know, that make them attractive. And that's what attracts you to them, and what makes you want to be with them, to live your life with them. Now what this means is, okay, so we'll never settle with respect to the essentials, but of course with the inessentials we do, is a woman has to have a very clear idea of what is essential and what is inessential, and kind of articulate that for herself. Second, she has to be self-consciously looking for the essentials and not be distracted by the inessentials. And sometimes, unfortunately, you can be distracted. I know a lovely young woman who, uh, who should have married very well. But unfortunately, her father, with whom she was very close, had a particular quality that she especially valued, and that is that he was funny. And so she was really attracted to a guy who was funny. And she married a funny, funny guy, or at least she thought he was funny, and he turned out to be a very, very bad man. You know, whether he was funny or not, because there's no guarantee that funny people were going to be good, 
or vice versa, right? You know, there's, no, there's just no necessary connection there. You know? You've got to focus on the essentials and not let the inessentials distract you. Of course, with guys, or you just talking with guys, I'd have to pan them over the head about the physical side of things, right? You talk about the inessentials. I mean, obviously it's nice to have somebody you consider at least moderately attractive, you know? Okay, fine. But guys are so vulnerable to making really stupid decisions on the basis of a woman's looks. Or, frankly, on the basis of her sexual attractions. And that's a real problem. Uh, rule number four, mantra number four. I, having said in three that I want to find a good man, four is, I will make myself more and more a woman to whom a good man will be attracted. And it's a corollary to the previous rule. You want to prepare yourself to be desired by the kind of man you want to desire you, right? Most importantly, that entails working on your own virtues. You, know, you ask the same you know, kind of things. You know, am I responsible? Am I, you know, it just goes on and on. Am I hardworking? You know, uh, so many different virtues. And it means examining ourselves, knowing our strengths and weaknesses, and make, making a conscious effort to actually work on our weaknesses. I mean, that really should be what a lot of your life is about. Understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are and working on the weaknesses with grace. You know? uh, it's not incompatible with your dignity and worth to work not only on virtues, but to work on other things as well. And I'll just note them in passing. Uh, I'll throw out six things that make women attractive to men. One is the physical. I mean, there's nothing low or ignoble or base about trying to make the best of your looks. And, uh, and it's amazing what variety there can be in terms of, of individuals and how they look. That is the same individual at different times. You know, basically this is, what's the name of the show? You guys yeah. Cable, what? Makeover. You know, it's these makeover shows, my, my daughters watch them, and my wife watch them all the time. You know, we have, you take this woman who looks just awful, and by the end, you kind of say, wow, yeah, I mean, she may not be a beauty queen, but I mean, wow, what a difference it is. So we all have potential to be attractive in some ways, you know? And there's nothing, I mean, not that many women are going to despise that. But there are some women who, especially certain Christian women, who kind of on principle don't make an effort to kind of fix themselves up and look attractive, you know, because they, they somehow think that's not Christian or something. Uh, as I say, there aren't many that way because it goes so strongly against a woman's nature. You know, women want to be attractive. Uh, but there are some people that way, but that's an obvious thing. Second, being pleasant and fun to be with. That is having a smiling, optimistic demeanor. If you ask guys what attracts them, well, I'm not sure if you ask them if we'll be honest or not, but you know, if, if, you, if you want to know what attracts guys, uh, to tell you the truth, to be entirely honest, the way, at least my understanding of, of that, in general, a woman who has a, a moderately good figure, who has moderately attractive hair, who doesn't have grossly ugly features, then the fourth thing I'd say is, and who has a nice smile. It's amazing how important a smile is from the standpoint of sexual attractiveness. It's, very, it's, it's really uh, a very important part of what it makes a woman look sexually attractive. And having a kind of a pleasant demeanor makes a person fun to be with. You know? Having a down in the mouth, negative, unhappy demeanor makes a man or a woman not particularly pleasant to be with. So it's another reason why it's a great thing to be happy. 
Be happy with yourself and be happy with your life. Because if you're happy, you're going to be much more attractive. Because we're all attracted to happiness. You know? it's, it's just a natural human thing. Third, be interesting. And be interesting means have interests. You know, lots of different interests. You know, don't confine yourself to a very narrow range of things. If all you can talk about is the latest TV show and nothing else, that gets boring after a while, you know? You know? Have a lot of interests, pursue a lot of different interests, and you will be a more interesting person. And that's good. Four, hint. Very few men don't like to talk mostly about themselves, okay? So if you want to be attractive, be a good listener. It's enormously important to be a good listener. Uh, uh, it's amazing how many men stupidly will walk away from a conversation with a woman where the woman has said maybe five or 10% of the things that were said and comments on what a good conversationalist she is. <laughs> By which he means she listened to me or was interested in what I had to say. Uh, if I were giving a talk to men, I'd say that times 10. Because <laughs> there's nothing more sexually, well, I can't say that. I don't want to get carried away. But part of a man's sexual attractiveness is listening. A man who listens to a woman, partly because he's so rare, is enormously attractive <laughs> to women. You know? And especially if men can actually listen to a woman with their eyes. So many men don't do that. In fact, you know, sometimes I, when I give talks to men about how to be good with their wives, I say, do this, try it, and see how it works. Spend an evening of conversation with your wife. You sit down at the dinner table and latch onto her eyes like a laser. Just you know, beam in on her eyes and really intently listen to her. I'll bet you that within 10 or 15 minutes, she's going to say, what's wrong? Because <laughs> it will be so unusual. Of course, the right answer is, I just can't take my eyes off you. <laughs> that often leads to a very, very pleasant evening. <laughs> so listening is a tremendously important virtue or habit to get into. Five, men like to be listened to, but they also, as I suggested earlier, they love a woman who has a certain kind of independence and even an ability to push back. That is, a woman who can burst a man's bubble a little bit when he gets a little full of himself is much more attractive to a man than a woman who just is kind of gaga and obsequious. You know, that is, there's an attractiveness about having a kind of independence and uh, a, a confidence that lets you tease a guy, you know, when he gets a little full of himself. Uh, I wish I could turn the, the, the video off for this section because I, my wife was just so good at it. I mean, she dated a zillion guys because she went to St. Mary's in Indiana and I was at Notre Dame, which was not quite at the time, and the ratio was seven guys at Notre Dame for every girl at St. Mary's. So if you were you know, fairly attractive and interesting, you would basically be out every Friday, Saturday, probably Sunday night with a different guy if you wanted to, you know? And one of the things, I, I knew of the guys who dated my wife, and one of the things that was particularly attractive about her is that she could really stick a needle in a guy when he got a little too full of himself. And guys tend to get full of themselves. And so that, that, that kind of confidence was kind of very attractive. Because let's face it, in a way, we all like a challenge. I mean, that's something, that's nothing new to observe about sexual attractiveness. You know, if, if we pursue another person, and in a way we win them real easily, too easily, there's, there's no kind of thrill of the chase, you know, kind of. I mean, it's true with, I think, both men and women, that they like to, they like to pursue somebody who has a high enough self-regard 
that you feel like you're actually accomplishing something when you win their heart. You know? if, if you kind of win their heart because they're giving it away for free, you know, in a way you haven't really accomplished much. And, and so it's important to have a certain kind of reserve about yourself that you don't give away yourself too easily, you know, too cheaply, you know. Every guy, when he marries a woman, should feel that it's an extraordinary privilege that she was willing to choose him. You know? And it's, it's, it's not healthy if a guy thinks he's doing the woman a favor. And that's just a, a prescription for disaster. And so this is, again, where this kind of self-confidence, this sense of self-worth, that the gift you're bestowing on a man when you agree to be his wife is a great gift. It's something that he should value because of that. And finally, my wife suggested that I add this as well. A sixth quality is a certain kind of refinement. You know, women today, because they mix with men so much, have somewhat less refinement than I think has been true in the past. There's a lot of women you know, use vulgar language, for example, you know, rather frequently, especially among themselves, not just among themselves. And there's men are often kind of initially attracted to women who are kind of one of the guys, you know, in their manners, the way they carry themselves. It gets tired after a while. You know, men, I mean, there's in a way a loss of, of mystery, a loss of, you know, refinement that is not attractive to men. It doesn't mean you have to be hoity-toity or you know, uppity or uh, cold or any of those things. But it does mean a certain kind of refinement in the way you comport yourself, the way you carry yourself, not being just one of the guys. At any rate, those are you know, virtues and then a lot of these other things are, are factors that are worth cultivating. Rule number five, or mantra number five, especially important for women, even more than men. I will not be ruled by, emotion, by my emotions, by what is immediately pleasing to me. The history of mankind, of men and women, is how extraordinarily often, in the face of all human experience, people make the same mistakes over and over again letting themselves be led by their feelings and their emotions. And when it comes to men and women especially, you know, so often men and women, but especially women, are led by their emotions and they're led in ways that are, uh, that are very destructive to them. Uh, now sometimes it's fun to play a game, if I were the king of the world, what would be the, the law I would pass? And I think my law would be, no woman can get married until she's read Kristen Lovren's Daughter. Kristen Lovren's Daughter is a trilogy by a Norwegian novelist named Sigrid Unset, who won the Nobel Prize around 1925. Sigrid Unset, uh, or Kristen Lovren's Daughter, literally it means Kristen, daughter of Lovren's, is a three volume tome. I mean, just it takes a long time to read. And it's, I think, remarkably insightful about how a woman's choice of a man shapes her entire life. And Kristen chooses a man who's not terrible, but in some ways he lacks key virtues. And the result is that Kristen ends up having a very difficult life. It's a wonderful book. I, I warn you that the first 70 pages are mostly descriptions of Norwegian farms in the 14th century. <laughs> so you, you really got you to really push yourself to get through the first 60, 65 pages. Once after that, I couldn't put the book down. I was in love with Kristen. I mean, it's, it's just an extraordinary book. Uh, and uh, I, I really encourage you to put it on your shelf and, and read it someday. Uh, because there's just so much, I think, human wisdom in it. It's a very interesting book. So, emotions are not a bad thing. 
Emotions are essential. If a person lacks emotions, they actually lack an essential component of being human. We need the emotions because they're there precisely to reinforce us in our pursuit of the good and the avoidance of evil. So emotions are good, and not just that, women's emotions are especially good because women's emotions are so much richer in many ways than men's emotions. I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of women just find it hard to believe that men aren't really hiding all their emotions and not talking about them. And they keep kind of picking and picking, you know, open yourself to me, let me know what's inside of you. And they don't realize there's nothing there. <laughs> I, mean, there I mean, it's not there's nothing there, but what's there is very limited. And they've already said it, you know, because their life is so much less emotionally deep than a woman's life is. It's one of the frustrations of, of women in their lives. Uh, and I, this is true, as I said, good marriages too, not just bad marriages. So uh, just, that's just part of the differences between men and women. And those differences between men and women, there's a division of labor for a purpose. And, and each, in a way, provides things that the other lacks. And men can learn from women to pay more attention to emotions. And women can sometimes learn from men to control emotions more as well. They both learn from each other. Um, and life would be much less rich without the, the sensitivity that emotions give a woman. And it's one reason why they are so important in the family and in society at large. You know, a society, I mean, it's, 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 there's an irony that people who believe in very traditional sex roles should be committed to women having a place in society. Because if it's true that women and men have different strengths that complement each other, it's not just the family that needs those complementary strengths, it's all of society. And it's one reason why it's good that women have a much more established place in public life, in society, than they used to, because they can add a dimension to it that would otherwise be missing. Uh, so, emotions are important, and without them, we'd be in bad shape. But they need to be directed by reason. And women are more vulnerable to be led by their emotions rather than by their reason. Incidentally, this is one of my art, my wife's arguments for a male priesthood. Because she said, if women were in confession, they would, they'd say, oh, don't worry, that, that's okay. Don't, they'd be so moved by people that they wouldn't actually do what a priest has to do in confession, which is partly to judge, to say what's right and what's wrong, and to say this is wrong. I mean, women, it's like, I mean, it's the same thing actually with raising kids. If a woman raises a child alone, or a man raises a child alone, the child really is going to be, in a way, damaged. Because there really is a difference. Now, of course, we're talking about generalizations here. In any given marriage, you know, you know men or women are, are different, obviously, along a different range of features. But in general, it's true that men are likely to be the one that enforce the rules, and women are to be the ones who are in a way softer and more forgiving. You know, you're more likely to get justice from dad and mercy from mom. Now, ideally, mom and dad are actually talking to each other. So they're not actually doing the different things. Yeah, it's OK. No, it's not OK. They're actually talking with each other and coming up with a united front that reflects both the justice and the mercy. But emotions, you know, they, they can really play havoc with us. They can lead us to accept things that maybe we shouldn't accept. And women have to be careful about that. If emotions have to be directed and channeled and limited, it's especially true that sexual passions have to be limited 
and channeled and directed. Sexual passions are enormously powerful. I'm tempted to say that in the natural order, they're the most powerful passions that we have. Just looking at human history, and looking at society, I mean, you see, I mean, the incredible power of the sexual urge. The sexual urge is meant to be really powerful because it's precisely what helps to support the bond of marriage that has to survive 40 or 50 years of a lot of good things and a lot of bad things as well. I mean, life is often tough. There are a lot of difficulties in life, a lot of, a lot of things that we have to meet that aren't easy to deal with. And that's true of our sexual partners, our spouses. And if, if we did have the sexual bond, the marital bond would be much weaker. And in fact, given that in contemporary society, the sexual bond is no longer confined to marriage, that may be one reason why marriage is weaker. I mean, this may sound too much like the economic analysis of sex, of sex or a, a variant of it, but if sex is something you can get only in marriage, one very likely result is that people will marry more, you know, which they're not doing as much nowadays. Many fewer people are getting married. And among other things, that means fewer children. Among other things, that means you guys are going to have a really tough time taking care of me and other people like me when we get Social Security. You know? That a society on a whole range of issues is going to have a lot of trouble if population is declining. And it is declining partly because people aren't getting married and not having kids. The sexual urge helps us to get married and have kids. So it's very useful that way. Uh, but it's also useful within marriage as well. Because if, as long as you're committed to the idea that sex is only in marriage, that you don't you know, commit adultery, what it means is that you're living with another person who provides you with something that you really, really want. And what it means is that you can't stay mad at them very, very long. You know, because women don't like to make love to their husbands when they're in the middle of a fight. Now, men can't understand that at all. <laughs> men can be in the middle of a fight and just drop it like that and, yeah, let's go for it. You know? A woman feels like a prostitute, you know, if all of a sudden it's just physical. She wants it to be love, and if you're having a fight, it's not love. So you have to kind of repair the bonds, fix them. And what that means is that men have to work harder at being decent people. Because just even if they, even if they look at it just from the standpoint of, I want sex. Now, of course, they don't think of it quite that bluntly, you know? But you know, there's some sense in which, yeah, you do want to have that closeness, partly because you really enjoy that closeness, you know, the physical closeness. And so it's a tremendous support for marriage. A friend of mine recently kind of referred to the, to the little dance of, of sex and marriage. You know, that you have, you know, you get irritations and annoyances, and then you kind of have to you know, work your way through the annoyances to get in a position where you can actually renew your marital covenant physically. And that's part of you know, the ordinary you know, life of marriage, that, uh, that sex plays that role. But of course, sex can also mislead us tremendously. You know, it, it can be a powerful bond in marriage, but taken out of marriage, it can be t tremendously destructive. Uh, and we see examples of that all the time. I mean, the number of families that are broken up because men especially, well not exclusively, can't control their sexual urge and get tempted to stray, to commit adultery or whatever. And if they do, it's very hard to to reestablish the bond. Um, finally, making what is the, probably the second most important decision of your life under the sway of a strong sexual urge that you don't control well is almost a guarantee 
of making a really stupid decision. That is, guys who are besotted with a woman because she's beautiful or attractive or whatever it is that appeals to him are likely to make a really bad decision about who to marry. Women who just are so needy and vulnerable really want this guy are very likely to make a really bad decision about whom to marry. You need to have a certain kind of self-possession, a kind of self-control, and that means especially limiting this very powerful passion that's associated with the sexual impulse. Rule six, mantra six, the last one. There is hope, this will end. I want to be part of a community that helps me see what is important and what is not, and that helps me pursue what is good and avoid what is not good. We're all social beings. We're influenced by the atmosphere in which we live. You can call that the moral ecology. If we want to find ourselves a person that we give ourselves to completely in marriage, we need to put ourselves in a position where we're likely to find such a person. And that means working at finding supportive social groups that will help you identify the kinds of people that you want to marry, the kinds of people have the virtues that I described earlier. Now, where do you find them? Well, I mean, you can find them all kinds of places, I guess. I mean, I'm not saying you can't find somebody online. I mean, you know, online dating is taking off and it has a certain value and you can do things there. But, you know, frankly, I think, I think the best place to meet a potential spouse is by being in a group where you do things with other people. You know, being in a, a church group, being in a, uh, a pro-life group, uh, being in a group that uh, is a, based around a certain interest, you know, a reading group because you like reading, or music, or the arts, or sports, or politics, or whatever. The key advantage of meeting people that way is that you get to see them outside the context of a date, outside the context of a, of a social engagement. That is, you get to see them in a way in their natural habitat, you know, the, the way they act normally. And that's really important. Because generally, when we have a social engagement, a date or whatever you call it, with somebody of the opposite sex, we kind of try to be on good behavior, right? And it means we may suppress some of the vices that we have in order to be more attractive people. The problem is that if you only see somebody in those circumstances and then get married, after you get married, those circumstances no longer exist. People revert to being themselves. And what you want to do, as I said earlier, you want to see people's virtues, their qualities. The way you do that is by seeing them living normal lives. You know, working on a project together, doing things together. So, uh, you know, I really encourage you to, to do that, to, to join different kinds of groups in order to spend time with people. Not sure it's days even, you know, you might be working in a group together, but you start seeing, noticing, well, not just obviously who attracts you, because that'll come easily enough, but to see what kinds of qualities they have, whether you should be attracted to them. In some ways, that means forming a subculture. Because the society out there that you're a part of, that subculture is not likely to provide what you need if you're going to be looking for somebody that is worth, worthy of giving yourself to. You know? And that's what you're aiming for. You want to really give yourself to somebody who is worthy of receiving that extraordinary gift. And you have to think of it that way. You have to think of yourselves as an extraordinary gift, you know, which this guy is very fortunate to be getting. And that's not the natural way of thinking about things. We're mostly, you know, we tend to be insecure. So, conclusion. Happiness is something of a paradox. We all aim at it, and yet we attain it most effectively not by focusing on that happiness per se, but by focusing on living a good life, 
with happiness being a, a byproduct of living a good life. Ultimately, we are most secure, least vulnerable, if we have a deep trust in God, a sense that he will show us our vocation, that he, he will enable us to live, us, live it, that he has a kind of mission or plan for us, and that he will provide what is necessary for us to discover that. And that takes faith, because sometimes it really doesn't seem that way. Sometimes it's just really unclear about you know, where God wants us to be, you know, what it is that's going to be uh, the, the happy, you know, the, the place where we're going to be happy. But if we have the confidence that God will provide it, we're much more likely actually, I think, to find what we're looking for. My wife often, when she talks about these kinds of subjects, really recurs to the image of Cana. You know, that Cana is a place where Christ turned water into wine, took a very ordinary, plain thing, and turned it into something rich and very desirable. And I think Christ did that at a wedding. He did this first miracle at a wedding because he also wanted to describe what he does in marriage as well. That, you know, if we rely on God, you know, the water that we are, with all our limits, will be turned into wine. You know, that God can enrich us you know, himself and then enrich each other by the union that we achieve together in him.